Welcome to Adapt It, the podcast where we explore adaptations of various forms. I'm today's host, Tom, and with me is... Pat. And KJ. Today we'll be discussing The Orchid Thief from 1998 and its adaptation, Adaptation from 2002. Okay, so The Orchid Thief, the book by Susan Orleans, is an expansion of a 1995 New Yorker article she wrote in which she covers a law case of one John LaRoche who was caught stealing ghost orchids from a protected wildlife reserve in Florida in the Everglades. And he has this unusual argument because he went with these Seminole Indians that the Seminole Indians, by virtue of being under tribal law, cannot be convicted for taking these things. She goes down there to interview him and learn about the case. And though he seems to be a rather odd and kind of socially unfit man, she finds him extremely intriguing. She learns about the orchid worlds, which she, the orchid world, which she finds sometimes intriguing. Sometimes she, she just seems to be taking account of what's going on. Um, and other things. Present. She's present. <laughs> She's there. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she is there occasionally. Um, and then the book ends and that's that. The movie adaptation is somewhat based on a true story for I would say maybe 40% of it it's based on a true story in which the screenwriter who gained some fame for his film being John Malkovich is asked to adapt The Orchid Thief into a movie. Since there is no dramatic conflict he has absolutely no idea what to do and he becomes blocked and he ends up having to work with his twin brother who's kind of a, a bit of a doofus but a lovable doofus and by kind of working with his brother, he's able to eventually discover some secrets that were not in the book and make a screenplay from those secrets. Um, of course, it's ridiculous. The secrets are obviously something he made up to deal with the fact that this book has absolutely no conflict in it whatsoever. And the fakeness of his solution to writer's block is sort of where the pleasure of the film comes from i think it's why people like that film so can i i just want to i just want to share it just so that just for the audience if they have not read the book <laughs> this is what i thought reading the book was like in and since this is from 1998 or you know no one would no one would have been able really able to make this analogy at the time it's essentially like having a very long um, session of of sort of Wikipedia navigation, where you sort of start on the trial of John LaRoche and you start reading and then you see something you're like, oh, oh, this this I, I, what, well, let me click on the orchids link and then you click on that and then you sort of scroll through that for a bit and you read about oh different types of orchids and you say oh a history of po orchid poaching let me click into that and then you click that and you scroll through and it has like notable instances of poaching and maybe one or two of them you click into and get lots of details on that one but then you get a couple more and then you sort of backspace back into your original one and you go back to the trial for a little bit and then you scroll down and eventually you're like oh let me read a little bit about the history of land fraud in Florida because there's a link to that, there's a link to that in this Wikipedia article. And so you link to that and you read about that for a little bit. And then you go back to the original. I mean, it's that's, that was what reading the book essentially was like, it just, it felt like she had an article and then it felt like she read a lot of books about, about orchids and about the history of Florida. And she wanted to tell you about the, the, that history of Florida. And so she just found some interesting little anecdotes and, wrote a few pages on each of them. Um, that that was essentially what the book was. As they said, there's no conflict because it might as well just be reading a Wikipedia article. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's a scene in, um, there's one scene where Charlie's talking to his agent and he's reading the New York review of books of the book. And he's like, he's reading the review and the review says, um, it's basically a sprawling mess of barely interconnected episodes. And he's like, yeah, I, I, it's like that sprawling New Yorker crap. I just, there's nothing here. And like throughout the movie, he constantly is praising the book for some reason, because I don't think the prose are also that exciting. Um, it does have my favorite analogy that I've ever read in a book. 
Do you want to share? What's your favorite analogy? My, my favorite analogy, it's in like the first two pages. And they're talking, about, you know, about John LaRoche and how he, you know, they say that he often has like, you know, he was obsessed with, you know, fossils for a bit. And then he just dropped fossils and he was no longer interested in fossils. And then he became super interested in orchids. And then, you know, for the most of the book, he's obsessed with orchids. And then he just drops orchids and he becomes obsessed with computers. So, you know, he has all these interests and how they just sort of arrive and then he drops them. So she says, that, she says that his passions arrive. Well, they, they arrived unexpectedly and explosively like a car bomb. I'm like, yeah, I guess no one expects a car bomb. <laughs> That's, that, that, you know, she strictly speaking is accurate. If, if it's not, particularly sort of revealing but sort of there's a number of them like that you know it was like it was like an intruder intruding upon the intruder i'm like what <laughs> this is very awkward <laughs> but my favorite is still it arrived they would arrive unexpectedly and explosively like a car bomb yeah it's uh, the, the book is uh, and it's also with the book too i don't know if you had this feeling she doesn't seem that interesting a person and she doesn't seem that interested in this world i mean she keeps talking about wanting to see a ghost orchid which she, she never does um but there's very little about her that seems particularly compelling and there isn't you know and she's so frustrated with john laroche and, and rightly so it seems um but that's more what i get from her is that she's just kind of irritated a lot of the times or, you know, a, a, such a blank narrator that there's nothing exactly compelling to to attach to. No, and I don't know if that is the appeal. I mean, there's I don't necessarily mind a book like that, you know, something like To the Lighthouse. I mean, there's there's no conflict in To the Lighthouse. You know, it's essentially just a series of meandering, very beautifully written series of passages and prose and sort of a connected series of characters and events like there's and nothing ever really happens to it except they want to go to the lighthouse and the first day they don't go to the lighthouse and then 20 years later they do go to the lighthouse that's it nothing else happens in the book um you know so it, it's not necessarily that that's a problem per se i just yeah i think to your point it it did definitely feel like an article that got very stretched into very long things because i just you know it, it's interesting to read about some of this stuff but i have no idea why it's there and she is she doesn't yeah she doesn't seem all that interested in it and i think that's the joke of the adaptation is that she literally you know the, in the in the film when it starts to go off the rails what you know when he clearly can't come up with anything to do he he invents that the reason laroche was trying to get these orchids was so that he could that the seminal indians use it in a drug that makes people interested in things so that, <laughs> you know, it's just literally and so she starts taking this drug because i think i think kaufman picked up on the same thing like she doesn't even seem interested in this topic why does she care and so that's why it's like oh it has to have just been a drug there was a drug that made her really interested in these flowers and that's why she's writing about it because it's the only thing i can think of as to why this book exists yeah part of the conflict that they introduce or that kaufman introduces in his script is that meryl streep who play meryl streep's character who is the author susan orleans is deeply uninspired by life it seems that just the the energy in her life has run out and she doesn't have this intense passion that laroche has and if you look at the book a lot of the orchid people have the orchid people are really passionate about about these flowers um the expense they go through is very impressive in order to acquire certain things or whatnot and even though it's not really clear in the book that this conflict exists because i don't think it does he just kind of puts that in there in the movie that wouldn't it be exciting to be as excited about something as laroche's about flowers or these people are about flowers and so yeah that, that naturally leads into well here's a drug that makes you super excited about flowers or phone tones or, or anything else that's going on in the world um it's it's sort of a, it's the drug you need to take in order to read this book. It, 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 that's kind of I think to your point, yeah, that's kind of the joke of it. Um, but it's also his way of introducing a character arc, which you know ends up starting out honest and just becomes a joke because 
where else can it go? I mean, you know, the book doesn't lead you anywhere, lead to any kind of uh, adaptation. I mean, I'm curious, KJ, you didn't read the book. So I'm more curious, but that's my thing is I'm curious at what point did you realize that the book, the, the, the book and the movie had gone off the rails or did you realize that the book had gone off the rail that the movie was no longer in the same world so the first time i saw this movie i was in college and a buddy of mine loved it and what he specifically loved about it was there's a line in the movie that uh nicholas cage says i don't i don't want this movie to just like end in violence and guns and things and then the movie ends in violence and guns and things and like that's how I was kind of introduced to the movie. So even before I saw it, I kind of got that it wasn't an adaptation of the book literally. It's more of an adaptation of what it would be to adapt the book. And then what do you do? You go off the rails. You have the you have it end with the guns and the violence. You have it start with L.A. forty billion and forty years ago. Right? This movie is I I. I generally try to be kind to movies, but this movie is obnoxious from the first line of text, which happens after like an eight minute monologue by Nicolas Cage that I don't remember anything about. (laughs) So, but I mean, is that, I mean, is it intentional though? Is that what he's, I mean, it is intentional, right? I mean, he's making fun of the, (laughs) of that too, isn't he? Or is he not? I I have a little trouble distinguishing when he's making fun and, or what he's making fun of. I don't know. What do you think, KJ? Well, I want to compare it to something we talked about um, last week, which was the song uh, When I'm 64. Mm-hmm. Right? When I'm 64, we had brought up, was mocking that style of song. It's in the middle of Sgt. Pepper, but it's a wonderful song. I think if if the movie like kept my interest and I enjoyed the movie, then I'd be okay with it mocking itself and what it's doing. Not mocking itself. Mocking the genre it was in through itself like uh, when i'm 64 but i i think in college i fell asleep i don't think i actually i mean i saw the end but I, like i think i was nodding in and out this time it was it was it was a tough to get through not you know it was just kind of self important it felt like which again mm-hmm. i know is the joke but it, it wasn't the beatles it wasn't silly and like the beatles were yeah, I think when I'm 64 is also much more. I think this is the difference between satire and parody. And I think when I'm 64 is far more into the the parody camp of like here is the kind of sentimental song, and we know those songs and they're they're kind of silly. And we have this experimental album. But we have this kind of sappy song in the middle of it, but we're not like bloody toothed going at the song. We're not ripping that type of music apart we're going to sort of have a joke about it. And it's also going to be a very good song, right? It's going to actually be the best version of this song. And we're going to kind of be laughing at the same time. Um, This movie, this is where I have trouble with the the humor. And I I think it is also very, very self-important. I agree with you. I can't tell when he's just having a good time because he's just like, I'm out of ideas. This book doesn't work as a movie. There's books that can't be adapted, even if it was a good book. There's like, you you should not make To the Lighthouse, right? That that should also not be a movie. That would be equally as difficult to adapt. Um, So it's not an issue of the quality of the book. It's just this is not the type of thing that should be adapted. And so I can't tell when he's making that joke, when he's just having fun and laughing. And I think a lot of the the Donald stuff is him just having fun and and laughing. But it's kind of mean, right? It's it's kind of condescending. He's almost telling all writers that have been to workshops like that or have done a serial killer movie or, 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 or they're not, they're not, uh, they're not the same caliber as the other Nicolas Cage, the Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. And the audiences who watch it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I guess I thought, I mean, I thought that that was the, but I thought he was making fun of that type of person too. Like, I I guess I just, I thought he was Mm, making fun of that type of person where he's, you know, I don't think that the, you know, 
either of those versions, you know, the, 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 the Charlie Kaufman character, I don't know Charlie Kaufman. I don't know. I've never seen an interview with him. I know nothing about him, but just, you know, I don't think you could present the way that he clearly presents that character is, you know, that guy, I don't think you're meant to like him per se. Like, I don't think you're meant to be like, yeah, I agree with him. That movie. I mean, the movie does sound stupid. He's right. I mean, it is. A dumb movie. <laughs> it is. I mean, it, it points out like the hilarious parts of the movie. And, you know, mm. he's, he's right. Um, but I don't think he's, I think it's meant to be sort of, yeah, that, that sort of condescending that he is kind of a jerk and he is, he is condescending and he is mean. And, you know, his whole thing of, I wanted to take a, something that was beautiful and pure and just tell about flowers, you know, and, and there's no way that that, th I mean, I hope he doesn't actually think that, that that's not what, but I mean, it does beg the question of why did he try to adapt this book? Like, what was he thinking? What, what would anybody be thinking? Like, did he I mean was I mean, again, I don't know if he is making fun of himself and saying like, yeah, you know what? I thought I was that good. And I thought I was that impressive that I was going to like take this book. And then I tried to do it and was like, oh, man, this is terrible. I should have done a slasher film. You know, like, I don't know if that was his joke that he was sort of telling himself and was basically like, yeah, people who say this kind of thing and think they can do this are kind of jerks. And I was that. And yeah, this is just don't 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 listen to that i don't know yeah that's true he's also not kind to the charlie kaufman in the in the movie right that's very no, true i don't think he is i don't think he's i don't think he's meant to represent that character i think that character is meant to represent an extreme version of that type of auteur screenwriter person the ending though then where we're no longer following the book and now we're in the world of um his his imagination it's it's a funny choice. It, it is a bold choice too, but um, I remember he said he was, he thought he was going to get fired when he turned that in. He was sure like his career was over. <laughs> I mean, I did wonder. I'm like, how did he ever get this back? Like, because did Susan Orleo like or Orlean? <laughs> Susan Orlean like she must have read it. Like, I mean, yeah. she probably didn't have veto rights. Initially, on it, what she did was she like, say? Initially, she was like, okay, but can we change the name to not Susan Orleans? And then eventually she kind of just got on board with it. And she wrote a new introduction to the to her book, which was much more, um, which the introduction itself was very meta. So apparently she just enjoyed the joke and kind of got on board with it. So she does have a good sense of humor. I appreciate yeah, I, that. Yeah, she is. I was like, I actually don't know. I didn't. I don't think I read the introduction. Was there an introduction? Like there was an introduction. Oh, I didn't have an introduction. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, there was an introduction in the re-released one that was in that style. I read it years ago, um, just because it, I it was the only thing I had read of the book before I picked it up again for this podcast. But anyway, th so the ending also confused me because I don't know what the joke is, right? I mean, it's it's funny that he's like, screw it, we're doing this. But um, are we? sort of I, I mean the idea the obvious idea is that charlie and donald are like the auteur and like the quote-unquote sellout or the hollywood writer and that they have to come together to work together to make this movie and so they do and the movie itself is kind of a hybrid of these things but it's also a complete kind of sellout right? i mean the movie sells out this beautiful vision um but the movie is also mocking having that kind of beautiful vision. And the movie is also mocking how you, you know, how Hollywood makes things with guns and sex and drugs. And no matter what, you have to kind of just shove those things into your movie, regardless of if it fits or not. Um, and so I, I get to the ending. I'm like, what this seems to be, I can't tell, is he having fun or is he making fun of just everything? And then at that point, when you're just standing there and kind of laughing at everyone, but from no position, it does just become, you know, look at me, mock the world, right? Which is is kind of frustrating <laughs> to sit through. I guess I just saw it as, you know, the way the way I kind of saw it is that it, I I imagined that essentially this that the the joke of the movie is supposed to be you you kind of are, are that this is sort of how he wrote the script like he wrote it thinking originally like I'm gonna make this really artsy thing and then yeah he basically got to the ending and I I honestly I mean he was making fun of it but I honestly just thought he basically was just like I hate this and I want it done to your point he was just like I'm gonna get fired I don't care if I get fired anymore I don't care you can have the money back like I just want this done like I want to leave now like I'm tired of this here's your schlock ending here's your stupid schlock ending and I'm done like I'm walking away that was kind of what I that's how I 
thought it was meant to work is that he's not necessarily i mean he is mocking he is mocking hollywood he's mocking all these kind of things but it's more just as a just frustrated writer who basically was just i am done i just want this over with i've written myself in a corner i have no idea what to do with it i just need it over with and that's what it felt like it just felt like there was just this like here we go because i mean i i remember you know i was watching it and i didn't know that it was going to do that i had no idea and i did my wife and i were watching it and i paused it at one point just being like how much of this book is let, like nothing happens in this book what is he gonna fill this last like 35 minutes with and i paused it almost exactly being like i don't know what the next 35 minutes is gonna be and i kind of i'm pausing i'm waiting and i kind of had zoned out for a minute which isn't i guess that's not a good sign for a movie i had kind of zoned out and then it was like you know and then he's like i'll tell you the real reason why i was going after the orchids and i figured it was going to be some shocking and then it was like it was to get the drugs for the thing and i'm like what? <laughs> you know, like, what? You know, and it was like, what is this talking about? And then it goes, and I'm like, oh, see, this is funny now because I, I just personally thought that he was probably in the same mindset that I was in watching it, which was looking at my phone, being like, what am I? What are you going to do? To finish this? And he basically was like, here you go, just, just spit this thing out mm -hmm. as fast as I can because I have a deadline. That's mm -hmm. what I thought the joke was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's there. Um... There's just so much that he's he's just bringing he's just mocking convention so much too, right? Because he brings in like the the voiceover stuff. He's like, oh, I'm using voiceover, can't do that. And then um, he's even even the the solution to the problem ends up being a Deus Ex Machina. So it's you know the the the, the last thing the guy hears the, that he gets from McGee is you know, and don't you use a Deus Ex Machina. <laughs> I actually really like Brian Cox in that role. Yes, he was yeah, really was funny. Part mm -hmm. of, probably the best part of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so you end up getting like, here are these like conventions that don't work that he's using and he's kind of mocking that, he's mocking himself for using them. So not only is it, um, is he mocking kind of, or, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, to your point, Pat, I guess maybe he's not mocking, but he's putting up for humor these kind of conventional Hollywood things, but he's also intentionally showing you how he's shirking these traditional Hollywood things. I mean, it, it just, it does end up coming off either he's just the most pretentious man in the world and he's just, you know, he, he's jiving everyone. Or to your point, Pat, he's just like, I have no idea what to do. I'm completely lost. I'm just going to do everything and that's it. And I need a voiceover because I, I don't want to figure out how this character should share his feelings without a voiceover. So he's going to have a voiceover. And I have no idea how this schlop stops Chris Cooper's LaRoche. So a crocodile will do it or an alligator. I, I can't remember which one's which. Um, and that's it. I, you know, so it, it ends up becoming, I, I kind of agree with you more KJ. Like I, I have, I appreciate the kahunas that someone has to turn that script in. Um, the pretensions and the sort of let's mock everything type thing is it's a little bit to to bite into. I also kind of find Nicolas Cage exhausting in that role. Yeah, it, it, he did he's not, not work particularly for me. good. Mm. I don't know how he you got an for an Oscar. I don't know how, but yeah. and I I love Nicolas Cage movies. I'm usually in with popcorn and the whole nine yards. Like I'm not anti Nicolas Cage, but I don't think he was a good fit for uh, either of the Coffin brothers. Mm -hmm. Who Tom? You said great. they won an award, both of them. Well, they they got nominated. Charlie and Donald both got nominated for the script. And of course, Donald is not a real person. He made Donald up. So, <laughs> so I think it's the only time in Oscar history where a fictitious person has been nominated for an Oscar. Wow. It... He's on the poster, too. Yeah. R written by Charlie and Donald Kaufman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this also for the themes of our show, and this is our last episode of the season, right? It is. Um, I think this kind of brings in some of the bigger questions we've been talking about, which is, you know, the different, the differences that different media have that permit or don't permit transformation into another medium. And, you know, this book, Orchid Thief is a really good example. And I think this movie highlights it. One thing I think this movie does do very well is highlight that some things just can't be transformed or transferred into into another media. I think your point, Pat, with 
the works of Virginia Woolf. I mean, people keep trying to turn Mrs. Dalloway into a movie. I think there's one with um, Vanessa Redgrave that wasn't successful. I think there's another one as well. But there are these efforts to that that fail all the time to turn certain books, especially like modernist literature, into didn't movies. Didn't they turn? I mean, the hours. The, I didn't see the hours, but isn't that supposed to be an edit? Is that an adaptation? Of, no, it's you, an it's adaptation not. of a novel. And the novel is about three women, one of whom is Virginia Woolf, and they're interrelated stories. And oh, so I thought Woolf's... it was. I thought one of the stories was Mrs. Dalloway. I, again, I don't know. I've read. It. Oh, I didn't think so. I thought it was. I've oh, no I idea. I thought it was um, Virginia Woolf's story: a woman from the fifties, like a housewife type person, and then a woman from the eighties or nineties. Oh, okay. Yeah, Somebody who's I, contemporary I have... with the book. I just knew it had something to do with Mrs. Dalloway and Virginia Woolf, but I know I think one of the characters is reading Mrs. Dalloway or something. Yes, yeah, one of them is reading it, and then oh, okay. One so the reason I thought I didn't know what it was, I thought it, I knew it was three different people. I thought one of them was supposed to be Mrs. Dalloway, that it was like an adaptation of that, and then another one was like someone reading the book, and then another one was like a modern one. I didn't realize it was Virginia Woolf herself, yeah. so never mind. Yeah, it was Nicole Kid, bizarre choice of Nicole Kidman playing Virginia Woolf. Um, I. I cannot think of a person <laughs> i would cast as less than nicole kidman though she also won an oscar for it i think that had a lot to do with the fake nose they put on her but yeah but the um anyway but a lot of like modernist literature i know uh what's his name um keeps trying to make faulkner novels into books uh into movies um oh god what is his name michael bay Matt no, yeah. <laughs> oh God, I would kill to see a Michael Bay version of As I Lay Dying. <laughs> uh, no, he's um the guy from I can't believe Dave uh, Franco, James Franco. He keeps trying to make Faulkner novels into into movies, and they don't work. Um, well, I mean, I think... part of it is, I mean, at least you know, I think with a Faulkner novel, the reason you can't really adapt them is because there's, and especially modernist novels, I mean, the way that, and I'm not saying that The Orchid Thief works this way, I think Orchid Thief is not adapted for a different reason, but I think something like a Faulkner novel or, you know, a, a Virginia Woolf novel, these kind of things, is because part of the, they are novel, a lot of earlier novels were just sort of using the written word as a means to tell a story. So you can relatively easily take that and translate it into film as a different means of telling a story. Those other novels are much more about the the novel as a form. Like they are trying to make the novel as a form, not just a way to tell a story, but about the form itself and about how words work and about how words work in our minds and about how ambiguity works and, you know, of words work. You know, there's a lot more like about the actual process of reading it that it, it's very difficult to take that and translate into another medium because the author did not is not just using that medium to tell a story. They are using that medium as a way to explore the medium itself and explore human minds and all this kind of stuff in that films can do that, but they can't take something that was very specifically meant as a novel. That's really hard to take out of that form into another form. I think that's part of the reason why those ones work. That's not why the orchid thief struggles, but I think that's why some of those modernist novels in particular struggle. Yeah. To be adapted. Yeah. I, I suppose that's a good, that is a good point. It's, Something has trouble transferring form when the thing itself is about the the formal constraints or about experimenting or drawing attention to formal constraints. I mean, why it's probably impossible to do, I don't know, like Thomas Pynchon, like a film of Thomas Pynchon. People have tried. And there's one person in particular who has tried to make, I think, Gravity's Rainbow as an experimental student film, and it looks about as good as an experimental student film looks. But I mean, Pinchon's work is about the, this kind of jumble of of forms that a novel permits. And and to your point, Pat, you know, Virginia Woolf's work is about not only the internal monologue, but also experimenting with stream of consciousness, which is very much a specific novel thing or or a written prose type of thing and that you may be able to do it in a movie but not in the way most movies are made most movies have a different type of of media constraint i don't know how to say this but yeah i com i completely understand what you're saying pat and i completely agree but just to counter tom's stream of consciousness all's quiet on the western front worked incredibly well as a movie back in the day but i don't think the stream of consciousness was in it the stream of consciousness was not in the 
book or in the movie? Movie. You no, know, it was taken out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I guess the, but the, I would still say though that yes, there isn't, but the All Quiet on the Western Front, what did have a, I guess it, I don't remember. I haven't read it in a long time, but it does have a story, doesn't it? Like there I, is yeah. a, in, mm -hmm. and so they're using those techniques to tell a specific story and a, you know, essentially a plot, you know, for, for the most part. Whereas a lot of modernist novels aren't really that interested in plot. Um, I think there's like, there's an E.M. Forster um, quote or so, you know, in one of his books on writing, I think it's called, it's um, aspects of the novel. And I think he talks about, he goes through all the different aspects of the novel and he, you know, talks about the different things. And then he, he finally says like, and the plot, Ah, oh, God, yes, I guess we must have a plot. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, just, it's just like, I wish my books didn't have to have plots, but I got to have something happen. So there's almost this aspect, especially a lot of modern writers are not they're They're much more interested in other things than necessarily telling a plot driven story or even a story at all. They have other things they're interested in. Um Whereas All Quiet on the Western Front, I would say, generally was more story and plot driven. It's not That's quite true. as much mm -hmm. as like something mm -hmm. like, you know, other experiments, you know, like Catch-22 has a much more of a plot to it. There's sort of a bunch of characters and there's sort of a, there's much more progression. Um, whereas something like Mrs. Dalloway, yeah, there's a story, there is a party, there is a guy who kills himself. Like there are things that happen, but there's, it's not all connected. There's not all. There's not one thing leads to another and, you know, there, there's just there's a lot less narrative. And so I think they become very hard to, to adapt. Yeah, there's, le there's less dramatic conflict, um, which is odd because most books have the same kind of dramatic conflict that that films have. I mean, most books are just kind of pulp, right? Or even if they're very good pulp, they're still pulp. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why Dickens translates well, not because Dickens is just just pulp, but Dickens is based upon these kind of dramatic conflicts. Uh, there's a lot of them in his books, but they are... Well, because Dickens is trying to tell a story and mm -hmm. he's using literary techniques in order to tell the story. Yeah, but it's uh... the same kind of... Um, it's the same kind of storytelling that you could do on film. Yeah. Yeah, you could easily make and have many, 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 many people have made Dickens movies because it's it works well because there is opposing forces in all these stories. Right. As opposed to like Mrs. Dalloway or especially to the lighthouse where it's the internal monologues of characters. There's a war 20 years later, we, we get their monologues again and how the war has changed them. Um, so it's a grand, it's more of a grand focus on character itself. And we could just kind of meditate on character. I think Orlean's book to give it some credit or, or at least give it, or at least bring it into the conversation. I think she's interested in setting very much. I think she's interested in the orchid world that 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 is kind of a setting or a place. And she's interested in the Everglades, which is this kind of you know boundary space where there's Miami, which is right near there, and then there's a bunch of kind of crazy entrepreneurs. Um, but doing a movie about a setting doesn't work, or even doing a movie about characters doesn't work when we say a movie's character driven we mean there's interesting characters but it's still conflict driven it's still there's a dramatic conflict um and for whatever reason the best i shouldn't say the best books i think the books many great books don't need it right and that's before the 19th century a lot of experimental novels or an early age novels from the 18th century do this i think i'm i'm thinking of tristram shandy which has something like a, I mean, it's a thousand pages long. It has plots, but a lot of it is just kind of digressive meandering because the guy thought it was funny to do it that way. Um, and then you have the modernism and postmodernism, which also are, I think, in modernism focused on character entirely to the to the the abstraction of plot. And postmodernism is just a kind of a focus on almost like words and material. It's almost as if everything disappears in a lot of postmodernist stuff. Um, and movies, I, I don't know why movies, I don't know what the equivalent of that is in a movie. Um, Something like La Jete, as I would say. Yeah. The closest equivalent. I would mm -hmm. say La Jete is the yeah. closest. Or um, Sans Soleil. Sans Soleil is probably a better example. Yeah. There's these kind of like tonal poem things. I, I think movies have the problem, though, with doing a lot of that. 
because they're just so expensive. Well, the book, it's like one guy can do it on his own um, pretty cheaply. And so if you're going to make something that costs millions of dollars, even a very cheap movie is now going to cost millions of dollars, you, you naturally have to hedge against risk. And so these kind of wild experiments that speak to a niche audience and a niche audience that probably gathers over time. I don't know how famous Virginia Woolf was in her day, but you know, it's, it's it gathers over time. It's just something that anybody's putting money into films is, is not going to be able to do. And so you even have like David Lynch stuff. David Lynch stuff is dramatic conflict. It's traditional dramatic conflict. It's just very, very weird delivery. I think we're confusing um, taking writing and then writing with different writing techniques and exploring what a novel is with then trying to do that with film. I think when we do that with film, it's they get the lighting right. They get the score right. Dare I say special effects are even taking advantage of the film uh, medium. And that's where we would see the equivalent of some of these novels that I've never heard of that you guys are talking about. So in other words, Steven Spielberg, even though he's making blockbusters, He's experimenting with film with special effects, Jaws, not showing the monster, right? He, he is doing things that the novelists are doing with the novel medium. He's doing with the film medium, even though they're popular. And I don't know if Virginia Woolf was pos- pop- popular, you know, back in the day. But if she was, then it would make sense that Steven Spielberg is popular for taking advantage of the film medium. She was not particularly popular. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, she yeah. had a little bit more. Of, I mean, she did her own press and she did. She got some things sold. But, you know, and I, I think she she did get a little more exposure, I think, towards towards the later part of like the 30s. I think she was getting a bit more exposure popularly. Um, yeah, but I but... don't. She certainly wasn't like a Spielberg kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I guess it, it would be more like has anybody made a movie that's not like the Hollywood like we're going to make a movie about making movies, you know, like supposedly like what was that the movie the inception movie is supposedly a movie about making movies and you know like this kind of thing um that's a, that's what i've heard i've heard that's a theory of the movie inception is that it's supposed to be a film about making films and you know that's the whole thing with like the director and the set person and that's you know that's what they're creating in these dream worlds is like and sometimes people get so lost in their dream like that's a that's supposedly oh, it's a metaphor like a, for that yeah. <laughs> yeah it's supposed to be like a big metaphor yeah. for making of a film so that's my point not Fantastic. that kind of like thing but just like a movie that's about just like like we're not gonna, we're not gonna. There's gonna be no story. We're just gonna have special effects, and and you can just look at special effects and how that reveals something about, you know, like whatever we're looking. At. Like I don't think anyone's done something like that. And to your point, Tom, is it just because like, yeah, some person can just, you know, James Joyce can spend seventeen years writing Finnegan's Wake, which is essentially borderline gibberish, um, and. And he can do that because he's just sitting there by himself. And, and yeah, he kind of had to go through a lot of, you know, hardships because of it because he didn't have any money. But that was just him and his family. Like, it didn't really matter. Whereas Hollywood films can't do that because there's thousands of people putting money and working on it and releasing and distributing. Like, you can't just have these just totally bizarre, abstracted from reality, barely have a story things. They just don't. They just don't work. You just can't do it. The economics of the medium doesn't do that. Yeah, I think to your point, KJ, if I'm reading it correctly, the experiment isn't in the narrative or even in the characters. It's just in the CGI. Like, no, well, maybe the CGI. No, it's in the medium <laughs> the of film, mm-hmm. right? Um, I'm, I'm thinking Wes, uh, Wes Anderson, right? He does uh, Royal Tenenbaums and stuff. He does stuff with a camera very differently than other directors do i would say he's kind of experimenting with color with uh the diorama look like when you guys are talking about these novels and the different things those writers are trying to do i feel like directors are doing that with film now and there is still a plot because that that still works with what you can experiment with film that makes sense right star wars was an experiment we're gonna put a world war ii combat sequence in space that's that was a new idea at the time we're going to make it look as good as it did. I don't I don't think they had a, a trench run in space before, or a bombing mission, right? Before space was a very sterile, still, stiff thing, right? I mean, Stanley Kubrick did some ballet, but until George Lucas said, no, 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 we're going to shoot this well, like a dogfight in space, which doesn't 
make any physical sense, but it doesn't matter. It made an exciting film that we had never seen before. And then you apply the the sound effects that he did. So it, it might be a little bit the special effects, but I also think um, you take a, a Francis Ford Coppola film and stuff he's doing with lighting and somehow he's drawing us into The Godfather right from that opening shot of that sweaty guy's forehead. He's doing something with film there. And I'm, I have not read a hundredth of the books you guys have, but I'm assuming it's similar when you find the new author or you find an author that's writing in a style that you've never experienced before and it's working. I'm assuming that's what Coppola's doing, Lucas is doing, Spielberg is doing, um, you know, and and some of the offbeat movies you guys brought up, like uh, La Gite and um, I haven't seen Sans Soleil, uh, but I can imagine. Don't. Don't, yeah. <laughs> Tom, you do you like Sans Soleil? I have not seen it. <laughs> I've seen. Uh, I like Le Jeté. I do. Le Jeté I, I, is fine. Sans but you, you have talked crap about Sans Soleil for so long <laughs> that I've just avoided it. <laughs> I think. I think actually, as long as I've known you, you've hated Sans Soleil. <laughs> so... It is. It is. It is usually my. That is my go-to example of just like the most pretentious, horrible. I have no. I mean, like I get it. Like I understand. I know people love it, and I understand that. Fine. I still hate it. I think it's so painful to watch, and I I don't get it. I will admit I don't understand what it's doing. I don't get it. I hate it. I never want to see it again. <laughs> Fair enough. But it, I, I I kind of follow your point, Cage. It's just it seems like dramatic conflict. Yes, you could get rid of it in some experimental films, but the things that movies do that are innovative are in addition to or are there to highlight the dramatic conflict. It's almost like that's the structure we can build our experiments on. We need that. We need it. We need man against world or man against man or man against fate or what, whatever it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And once we have that, and once we have our three acts, right. um, then we can do the new. That's the architecture. And upon that architecture, we can put something new or something innovative. And you can do innovative things with narrative too. I mean, yeah, look at Memento, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but betrayal did it first, but um, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah betrayal did it in the seventies. I never mm -hmm. heard of betrayal. Hmm. It's, a play it's a play by Harold Pinter, who adapted um, the trial. He did the wow. boring trial. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> or or just the Kyle McLaughlin one, if we want. To. Oh, I, I guess to be nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we should call it the Jason Robards one, just because he's awesome. Anyway, um, I love Jason. I love Jason Robots, yeah. But uh, I lost my train. Uh, you were saying you can experiment with narrative in movies as well. You can, I brought oh, up yeah. one that didn't go forward to backwards. It kind of started in the middle. Mm. Yeah, uh, I guess. but I guess Memento is an experiment with narrative, sure. And there's some things where you get rid of narrative. I mean, Le Jeté, Le Jeté actually doesn't really experiment with narrative that much. It's still a traditional... It experiment with narrative, but it experiments with the technique of film to tell it. Because it's mm -hmm. essentially a series of stills, except for like the one series of motion. But it's mostly a series of stills used to tell mm -hmm. the story. But it's a dramatic story. It's man against Yes, it is, fate, it is a narrative basically. Story. Yeah. Which Passion did earlier, the guy that directed House. He had done that before. <laughs> well, John. Did he? Yeah, did you see, uh, remember House we watched, Tom? Oh, yes, he did do that earlier. <laughs> yeah, You're right. Was that before Le Jeté? Uh, that What's... I don't know exactly. Oh. But... <laughs> I... Okay, we have to look that up. Is he right? right? I think he might have done. I think Passion was before. <laughs> it anyway. took all season audience, but I'm on the high shelf too. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen this movie. What is the movie? Oh, God, it's so good. Um, oh. It's this one Japanese film to maker. It's, uh, it's on Criteria. It was on Criterion. It might still be on Criterion. But he made this movie House, which is a horror movie that's just completely crazy. Um, it doesn't... It's The special effects are purposely bad. Um, the characters react in kind of bizarre ways. It's just... It's one of these things where the filmmakers just like, I don't care, whatever. This is fun, so we're doing it. And it's a blast. And he made this earlier movie called Passion, which is, is a still shot film. It's a collection of still shots that was his college film or was that his first financed movie i don't know if it was financed but actually i think it's called emotion i think i might have mixed oh, up the um, emotion the title which came out in 66 putting it four years after la jit back to the low shelf for me oh yeah get the hell out of here <laughs> so close <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> but then, I mean, that's a really good. Regardless, you can you can dispel with narrative and film. You can. There's films that do this. Um, you know, especially actually silent films do this a lot because they just did not realize that people were going to be there for a story. So they're like, this is a spectacle, and we have to make this into a spectacle and and do things like that. Um, or juxtaposing different images together. You know, that's the whole um, Soviet montage theory is like, instead of words, we have to just put different things together that are unrelated and people will make them related. Um, so that's more absolute film. But I think to your point once, to your point, KJ, that the experiments, really the advancements or the innovations aren't really in narrative. Film is not the place that necessarily is best for experimenting in narrative. It's better with experimenting in the things that make film film. Yeah, capturing light, right? To put mm -hmm. it simply. Mm -hmm. Is it also partly because the just the nature of film, it it unlike unlike a book, film ha essentially has to move forward. It can't you can't sort of meditate or ruminate. I mean, you can obviously pause it, but for the most part it it is always progressing like there is almost like un unlike a novel where you can stop it you know you can you can go back you can easily read you can sort of you know reread a passage you can ruin it in a passage you can think about like there there's sort of an element of film which is just like it's a bit more passive and it's a bit more forced like you can't it's always in motion so there's almost an element i mean that's probably why sometimes those still still shot ones are interesting because they force you to just stare at one image for a period of time um but is that partially why film just is is a different medium because of that that aspect of it? It has to move forward. You can't stop it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. less personal because you're not controlling the speed at which you're consuming it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, is. yeah, the director is consuming is determining it, and that's why some of these works that are just that, that can do away with narrative that can just that can focus on just how the words on a page work. Are, are able to do that because they know that you can just look at the words as a whole. You can go backwards, you can move forwards, you can do whatever you want with a, with a book, but with a film. Yeah. The director is, the director has determined the pace, which to getting back to your point from a lot, from a while back, KJ is why video games don't adapt into film right. often very well, mm -hmm. because in that case, the, same thing. the, the individual, yeah, the person playing the game even more so than a book really is determining the pace mm -hmm. of, of how that, of how it's consumed. The, the the other big difference here is the director is expecting you to watch the whole film in one shot. The guy writing the book is probably not expecting you... The, the author of the book is not expecting you to sit and read the whole book in one shot. No. And I think it changes how you, how you would tell the story or the stories you might tell. And, I, and which makes me think of another thing. I wonder if um, books make more sense to adapt into tv shows if you're gonna put them on a film type uh medium because books are fairly episodic so let's step away from the experimental ones now right mm -hmm. the, the run of the mill ones the harry potters most books most, right? books, most are books, books yeah books, yeah and that first harry potter book every chapter is another episode it's a very very episodic book it it also tells a whole story of harry's first year at hogwarts but Chapter by chapter, they they have to solve the problem and get to the end of the chapter, and I I I do not like the Harry Potter movies, um, especially that first one. And I think part of the reason is you're trying to take something episodic and adapt it into something that's a three act structure. I think it would make a much better TV series than a, a movie. Well, they are trying. So are that's they? true. Yeah, I'm pretty they're excited trying. to see what they're doing. Yeah, it might they're doing a Harry HBO. Potter. TV, TV show? series, yeah, they're mm -hmm. trying to, yeah, because they don't, they, um, they don't have the rights to. Mo they're trying to do like other, they, you know, the uh, is it who owns the rights? Paramount, whoever owns them. I don't mm, know who it is. It's a good question. They're at whoever owns studios, the rights. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know who it is. Whoever owns them, they want to do more Harry Potter stuff, but they don't have any rights to any of the other stuff, so they can't do like spin-off stuff. But they still have the rights to the movies, so they can just take the those rights and transfer them to a television series, and do them. And they can make a TV series about them as long as it's that though the books they still have the rights to, so they can translate the books into television mm. shows. So they're trying to do that now. So they're just going to find a new Daniel Radcliffe and start again. No, no, I don't know. he's probably available. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was great in the Weird Al movie. Did you guys see Weird? I didn't. The Al Yankovic see. story. Yeah. Highly recommend that movie. I had a smile on my face the entire time, and he was great in that. 
he was only out. thing I think I've seen him in is the um the woman in black or whatever that movie was. Oh. I did not see that movie. It wasn't worth I, it. Yeah. It's it was one good. of my favorite film experiences because I went to go see it at like a midnight showing in New York City at a theater that was literally like falling apart. There were like holes in the ceiling and it was just mm. like total crumble fest. Mm. And it was the best. It was like so <laughs> much is like the best place to see even a not great horror movie because it was it was just it was a lot of fun. No, no, I haven't seen that. I've only seen him in the two Harry Potter films I've seen. I've only seen two of them. I, I don't think. I don't think I've seen him in anything else. Apparently, he's very good as a uh, Broadway actor. He's in Merrily We Roll Along, and apparently, he's great in that. But he supposed he was good in Equus too. He did Equus in Equus. Yeah, I, I have. I not. mean, I, I was. <laughs> he was in it. So was yeah, no, movie. yeah, no, I know. I, I have not. I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I read. I've never seen Equus. I haven't seen the movie, but I've read it, and it is a rough read. So I've not invested any more time in it. But um, regardless, I, I, I think that that's also a good point. But that's interesting because. That gets to this idea of a of narrative again, right? We're going to turn Harry Potter into a television show because there's actually a bunch of narrative we didn't get to. So we're taking. Oh, the I, I'm going to say it's more than that. Okay. The movie didn't work not because it cut stuff from the book, and I think it did. That's fine that you should. But every chapter in that book, a, a conflict is resolved, and I think that lends itself more to a TV series that might have ten episodes or have, maybe even however many chapters in a book you could do. As opposed to a three act structure, but that's still a dramatic thing, right? Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Right, movies do that really well. They do the you know X versus Y very well. But they do longer. I think KJ's point is they do longer story arcs. You know, if we're going with that Freitag thing, you know, they do they do one big one very well. They mm -hmm. don't do small mini ones over and over and over again, pr slowly progressing towards mm -hmm. a culmination. Which mo a lot of novels are written that way. A lot of novels are written episodically, which translate obviously well into episodes of a television show. They mm -hmm. don't usually as well translate into film because you can't keep doing the up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and, up and, down and slowly progressing towards a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Well hmm. said, Pat. Thank you. That is exactly <laughs> what I've been trying to <laughs> put it down. Yeah. I may not have my own ideas, but I can take other people's and explain them. <laughs> yep. That's that's my job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> work at a college that's all we do is take credit for other people's ideas but anyway uh yeah that makes sense and that that's interesting because it's like it's something it, it's still something in story that a book does well that a full-length movie doesn't do well but moving picture can do well it just has to do it in a an abbreviated form or in, a, in an episodic form um so that's a different thing that potentially moving pictures can share with books. So that wouldn't make something, a, a book wouldn't be unique in that instance because we have these streaming services and um, presumably network television, though I don't know anyone who watches it, um, that can I create like these things. Oh, Jeopardy's fun. Yeah. <laughs> but have you read the book? <laughs> like television? That's fun. Mm -hmm. And I think Game of Thrones is another good example. I think that the reason mm -hmm. one of the reasons that shows yeah. works well is it's episodic um and audience you have us at a disadvantage because you've heard our three body problem episode and we've not recorded it yet <laughs> so we may contradict all this or have already contradicted all this a few weeks ago <laughs> yeah well we'll see we'll see how well it can do that work the three body problem um yeah which is a there's a lot going on in that book so the episodes i think would work much much better yeah, I think that's a that is another thing. It can it can do well. But then I mean I guess you know getting back to our original point, why does the orchid thief so, I mean is is it just because because it's it's episodic in yeah, a sense. Yeah, the TV series you would have had the Florida real estate episode. It would have been like love it or list it. House hunters, Florida. That's actually a good <laughs> point. Would it could you get it to work essentially as a collection of almost like true crime series that sort of slowly build towards, I mean, you have to have some conclusion because there's nothing that just ends. Um, could you make it work better as a television show? Could the Orchid Thief have been better adapted into a television show? Like essentially like a true, a series of true crime things. Well, so it's funny you say that, Pat. While I was watching the movie, the LaRoche stuff felt a little bit like a docu-series that I watched called Bug Out, 
which was about an insectarium, which I think is a new word for humans, which means like an insect zoo that um, kind of uh, popped up in Philadelphia out of a, um, there was a exterminator who started collecting some of the bugs that he found in Philadelphia, and then eventually it became into an insect zoo. Um, but the docuseries is about how it kind of grew too big, somebody else came in, tried to take over, and then illegal bugs might have been being traded. So I don't know, it might work better as a docu-series or a, a mock-you-series, really, like a fake one about orchid thieves and John LaRoche. Like, I didn't see the Tiger King, but I, you know, that took over during the pandemic. So could you do it something like that? You need an ending, right? I, I mean, the, the problem with, that might work, right? And a docu, I, I think, think it, actually, that would work a lot better than the, I mean, th- th- they would work better than the movie adaptation did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is actually not a bad idea. I don't remember. Because I, I guess they, they were doing like the waiting for Guffman kind of thing back then. But it almost that would have worked. That would have been a better adaptation in some ways of The Orchid Thief than the movie adaptation ended up being. It might like have a been, mockumentary? I guess, more predictable. Yeah, the kind of mockumentary kind of mm-hmm. thing. Like you could have actually made an interesting thing out of that. Mm-hmm. Did LaRoche do anything illegal? Did he ever get in I trouble I think he or gets convicted. Did they even finish the case? Yeah, they do. The whole thing is that the they say that they they just avoid because the whole the, his argument essentially the Roche's argument is that I I never touched the plants I only told these different seminal guys which ones to pick and they're allowed to pick them because they you know the, because of the treaties that they've signed with the federal government that's essentially his argument and they just completely skirt it and say okay but you also cut down some branches off of trees and those are not you're not allowed to do that. That's what they basically go after. And they say, okay, so we're just going to go after the tree thing. And then they basically say, okay, you all are guilty. They find the like seminal guys, like 25 bucks pop and they find him like $500. And they basically like, you can't go in the forest for six, six months, months or something. something. Yeah. Well, there's and a dramatic just... ending. <laughs> <For punishment. laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, but you know, it's, but the book still has like another 80 pages after that, where she just wanders around to another six flower shows. And she talks about other people who make flowers at that point. Uh, and then and then LaRoche talks about how he now makes porn. Like it was like, <laughs> that's literally how the book goes. I'm just like, I have no idea what this is what where this is going. Mm-hmm. You know, it just sort of and then it just and she literally says she wants to go into the woods to see a ghost orchid. She goes into the woods one last time and she doesn't see one in the book ends. She says, I never saw one. <laughs> yeah. Apparently in an interview, she did not expect him when expanding this into a book to lose interest in orchids halfway through her writing and so apparently a lot of her time i guess she was sort of charlie which Kaufman. i guess it arrived unexpectedly yeah yes, it, right yeah it does say like a car bomb but she was like charlie kaufman it, herself in the sense of like she's like oh god how do i end this the guy just stopped doing the thing he was doing i my book is ruined um i didn't know that that does explain some yeah. problem <laughs> that does explain why it does explain the last hundred pages where there's the, the issue has been resolved she's and... literally she just drops laroche because she goes i tried to get him to go with me somewhere and he wouldn't go <laughs> And so she just went by herself. I'm like, what is this book doing? Why is this here? Mm-hmm. That explains that. Yeah. Um, but actually, yeah, a mockumentary, maybe that would be fun. I, I mean, the problem there is, while I don't think she's particularly interested in the orchid world, I think she can, she has some appreciation for the fact that these people appreciate it. And I think if you're going to go into that mockumentary style, you're going to be like making fun of these people, right? The kind of crazy orchid people, which is probably easy to do. It's probably very, you know, they seem somewhat eccentric, certainly. And some of them are pretty interesting, but you would basically just be making fun of well then let's say it's not a mock you it doesn't need to be like the waiting for guffman quite that extreme kind of Mm -hmm. thing but it can just be essentially like a you know it doesn't need to be the mockumentary but just a documentary that's just a fiction not fictional because it's based on true fact but just sort of a like a staged document yeah a staged documentary like that Mm -hmm. could have been a more interesting way to go about the narrative problems Mm mm-hmm makes me think of uh tom remember we watched american animals where they steal the paint from that so it could be something along those lines i mean i'm not saying i'm not saying this would make a good movie but it would be a better adaptation 
Like it's just how do you, how would you actually adapt this book? It's one of the only ways I could think to do it. Yeah, there is. Well, KJ, do you want to bring up um, or talk about what American yeah. Animals is? Um, American Animals is the story of these four college kids who are kind of bored, so they decide to steal some very and, and it's a true story. This actually right. yeah, based oh, these on ones a true story. Steal the books. Yeah, the books of art of. Um... Oh, I didn't know. I've heard the story. I didn't know they made it a movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could do it in the style of like American Animals or um, The Big Short. I haven't seen The Big Short. Oh, um, right. The Big Short. Right. I know what you're yeah. talking about. I read the book, but I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the movie. Oh, maybe we can bring it to adapt it. Yeah. That would be an interesting one. <laughs> um, but American Animals actually has, it mixes in interviews with the actual people who committed the crime as well as staging it. And so you see them. You, you see their interviews, you see them talking, and actually in some scenes, the actual criminals are in the scene. You'll see them kind of walk through and, and whatnot. Um, it, it's actually kind of insufferable, but it's not the, the way of integrating these different things isn't in itself the problem. It's just a, these characters are kind of aren't that interesting to watch. And so their heist is, um, and it's kind of obviously going to go wrong. So yeah, anyway, whatever. It's it's not a great movie, um, but that that might be a way to do it, because I from reading this, I was interested in like what does Laroche look like? What does he sound like? Like an interview with him would be kind of compelling. I couldn't find any online actually, but um, I don't know. That that might work. I mean, it doesn't solve the main problem though. Which is no, nothing happens. You know, <laughs> the issue that needs to be resolved is resolved pretty quickly. Um, I didn't even notice that it was resolved. I know they were going to do the thing with the tree branch, right? Where they were like going to convict someone for getting the tree branch, which for some reason has nothing to do with the, the seminal laws. But I didn't even realize like, okay, this this actually had been done. I thought that was the plan. I mean, so the the resolution is so uninteresting that I didn't even notice it when reading it. Um, and that, so that kind of documentary style still wouldn't fix the problems of the book. Um, and to give Kaufman and Spike Jones credit, the movie is very watchable, right? I mean, it's, I, I think it's very condescending, but it is, I did laugh out loud several times, um, especially at Donald's screenplay, but you know, things like that, it, it does entertain. I, I just think like, the kind of the meta thing, it it also feels very juvenile, right? It feels kind of like a a smart kid who's a senior, who's having you know having a little fun and being a little ironic, um, it, you know. So the movie ends up it, the movie ends up being about a cop out, right? And look how funny I am that I copped out, which is not that interesting to me, I guess. What did you say? Being meta? You said being meta. And... Oh. <laughs> Yeah, we we I think you had this joke, Pat, um, in college where um, being Brechtian means never having to say you're sorry. And yeah. so I just turned it into being meta means never having to say you're sorry, which could be the tagline of this film. All right. So I've kind of exhausted my my ideas on this film slash book. Anybody have anything else to say? Yeah. You know, I had one. My, my biggest takeaway from this movie. We've come a long way since Back to the Future, too. Right, those two Nicolas Cage's on screen looked way better than the two Michael J. Foxes <laughs> in Back to the Future too. I just, I every time I was looking, I'm like, nope, I don't, I don't see the lines at all. I don't, I, it is seamless compared to, uh, you know, when Marty McFly goes back to the '50s and Back to the Future too, and there's two of them. So I just, well done, guys. You know, <laughs> it did, it did. I will even admit, in the when I when the scene opened, I thought, wow, they got someone who looks a lot like Nicolas Cage to play this dude. Um, and then I realized, I'm like, oh no, that is not because, especially as I thought the character was only going to be in it for like 30 seconds, and they just got some dude who kind of looked like Nicolas Cage. And then I'm like, oh no, it's totally just Nicolas Cage. And I was like, oh yeah, this but screen's pretty good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, rest in peace, Donald. Mm -hmm. You done well. You done well. All right. Um, so I guess we're wrapping up our first season, right? We are. We are. Any any uh, reflections on any of the questions that we've been posing through? What were some of the? Well, what were we exploring in season one, or were we just feeling our way around? I I don't think we've come to kind of any kind of grand conclusion, right? 
and just looking at these different things, it seems like maybe the closest we've come to is, I think this kind of conversation now about what makes movies unique, which is these kind of experiments in, in visual stimuli, um, where what makes books unique is the experiments in kind of internal monologues and kind of verbal play, sort of an obvious thing, but you know, that's, that's what makes these things, um, their, their own thing. Uh, I don't know, like in terms of why do we have a movie always after a book? Why is a book never adapted out of a movie that ends up being as transformative as, you know, as the movie is or something like that? Um, I don't know if we've come to an answer. I think maybe it's in part because you have to expand the movie so much in making it into a book um, and collapse, like you're saying with the, the Harry Potter thing, you have to collapse all of, you have to collapse that grand arc into a bunch of little arcs and that requires a lot more work. It's, it's much easier to collapse narrative and then do all your fun stuff with the visuals. Um, so possibly that's an answer to that question or at least approaching an answer. But in terms of like lessons learned or anything like that, I, I don't think of any kind of grand lessons. I think it was, you know, kind of fun to, fun to explore these things. Like even the ones that weren't very good actually offered, uh, you know, a, a lot of room for conversation. I don't know. What do you guys think? I agree, Tom. I think at least this first season, we were just kind of feeling our way around. We, we did a bunch of different things, right? Video games, uh, the music, discography, certainly tons of books. Um, so I don't know what you're thinking for season two, but maybe we'll try to focus on on one thing and kind of hone in. Maybe we come up with a theme. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Absolutely. If you enjoyed Adaptation and are looking for more adaptations of The Orchid Thief, check out a local garden and see if they have any orchids. If they do, steal one and you will be the adaptation. Don't steal. You can rate and review this show anywhere fine podcasts are available. For those viewing in YouTube land, if you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the Talking Studios channel for all our exciting content, and follow us on social media at Talking Studios. Check out other shows by Talking Studios, including Talking Pictures Trivia, where we explore movies through trivia, Keep Making Movies, where we explore micro-budget films, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games, and Get the Point! where we slowly reveal a movie poster and try to guess which movie poster it is. Got a question for us? Call the Talking Studios hotline at 201-467-8679 and leave a message. It may be featured on a future episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Adapt It, wherever fine podcasts are found. That wraps up Season 1. Stay subscribed, and before the end of the year, Season 2 will pop into your feed. Wow, Talking Studios, 